Round two, fight! Capcom Stadium is back for round two, with 32 more games to fuel our nostalgia. The first collection was packed with classics, along with never-before-released exclusives. And if you watched my first review, you know how it performed and the games I loved most. And just like before, we're taking it to the next level, with lag tests for every game I show, and an in-depth look at my favorites. The interface is nearly identical to the first collection, with the same plethora of screen rotation options, video filters, backgrounds, button customization, and more. All of the convenient features like rewind, save states, challenges and achievements, and online leaderboards are here. It makes you wonder why they didn't just release all these games as a pack for the original, as now you can't have them all in the same place with the first collection. There's still no online play, which was one of my gripes with the first. But at least you can now buy games individually right off the bat for four bucks a piece. Or just get them all as a bundle. And before you decide what to buy, download the front end, which comes with a free game. So how does the games list compare to the first collection? Let's dig into it. Black Tiger is an old favorite, partly because it reminds me of Vegas. Dropped off at CD arcades while the parents went off to gamble, and I wasn't complaining. I didn't finish it back then, but I never missed the chance to throw in a few quarters and try to get a bit farther. I always dug the fast-paced gameplay compared to Ghosts and Goblins, which came out just a year prior. Maybe not as cool and with less variety, but really fun to try and speedrun once you memorize the stages. And memorize is the key word as Black Tiger is designed to wipe the floor with you until you memorize each little area and its enemies. Despite the fact that you're much faster, more maneuverable, have more health, and better weapons than poor Arthur ever did, death is just one wrong move away. Enemies come at you fast. Falling boulders are one-hit kills. And there's plenty of pits to slip into. It's chock full of gotcha moments at every turn. But it's also very learnable and not nearly as frustrating as Arthur's first go-round. Black Tiger definitely milks the D&D fantasy craze of the late 80s, and I was a fan. Mixing in a bunch of RPG-like elements to spice up the game. There's a shop to upgrade weapons, which will stay with you after death and even after you continue. But the much cheaper armor options won't last and have to be rebought as you lose them. There's even a very basic experience system based on score, which slowly adds to your health bar. Levels all have multiple paths, treasure chests to find and open, and short dungeon loot sections to enter on every stage. You're on a timer though, so you can't just sit around and collect coins and explore, needing to constantly grab hourglasses to extend the clock. The enemy variety isn't great, and they repeat in later stages, only with color-swapped harder versions. Even Firebrand makes a somewhat return, though not nearly as annoying, thankfully, as in the Goblins games. The checkpoints are very fair and numerous, at least enough to feel like you're not trudging through half the level again. In the end, Black Tiger's best feature is the mechanics of its gameplay, being both fast and fun to play with pretty tight control. Not purposefully cumbersome like Arthur, but it simply lacks the level of variety, creativity, and visuals of the much more popular Ghosts and Goblins games, and really plays nothing like them. I don't know if it's a classic, but it's still a very nostalgic game for me, and one I'm glad is part of the new collection. Three years later, Capcom released Magic Sword, another incredibly popular game that I used to play a ton in arcades. It's easy to compare to Black Tiger as they look similar and play fast, with an emphasis on speed running through levels and fluid gameplay. But it's a very different game, more of a linear, balls-to-the-wall hack-and-slash. Not quite as memo-heavy, but absolutely designed to eat your quarters like a slot machine. It's a wild loot fest with endless treasure chests, keys, and items galore, removing most of the exploration and RPG elements of Black Tiger, with stages no longer having the same verticality. In its stead, you have new action-oriented mechanics and a new set of companions. Magic Sword has an overcrowded prison system that'd make the US jealous, with endless hallways full of jail cells, and most are full of warriors, wizards, ninjas, and more, begging to be let out. 
Lucky for them, you've got a nearly endless supply of keys. Free them and they'll join you, adding their firepower to yours, each with their own pros and cons. Some are better than others, but they're all fun to experiment with. And they all level up and grow as you release them farther into the tower. Your own attack is nuanced as well, not letting you just hack away, unless you just want a weak, short-range attack. Wait just a moment between swings while your power meter builds up, and you'll unload a much more effective attack along with projectiles if you let it charge completely, adding an element of timing to the gameplay instead of just button mashing away. The same is true of some of your companions, like the wizards who need time to recharge, but fire effective attacks when they do. The graphics are much improved, of course, with more enemies and variety. And while things still start to look repetitive across the 50-floor trek, Magic Sword does a decent job of keeping things fresh. Though it does fall back into sameness with a lot of repeated bosses, primarily the dragons and chimeras, as when there is something new thrown in, like this really cool dual worm boss, it makes you wish that all the bosses were that creative. It's still a step up from the older, more repetitive Black Tiger, but still not on the level of the incredible Ghouls and Ghosts, which had truly unique levels and art assets for every stage. As nice as it looks, it's still a trek through 50 similar floors with new layouts and color swaps. But just like Black Tiger, it's all about the speed of the gameplay here, and doesn't spend too much time on any pomp and circumstance, with both speedrunning and memorization being the name of the game. Don't stop and smell the roses unless you want to get overwhelmed with enemies. It's all about the endless loot and chests calling your name, though not every one should be opened, nor should you ever linger too long. Do I prefer it to Black Tiger? I like the more nuanced attack mechanics and timing, adding some strategy to simply hacking your way across the screen, but being a lover of platformers. I really enjoy the verticality, jumping, and exploration of Black Tiger, while still maintaining a fast game speed and arcade feel. They're just very different games that happen to seem alike. That's not to say that I don't love throwing down with either every so often, as one thing both games do, they do extremely well. And that's no BS, fast-paced arcade action that's easy to play, but not nearly so easy to master, even if they can get repetitive after a while. If you thought Magic Sword or Black Tiger were hard, wait till you get a load of this game. Tiger Road released the same year as Black Tiger. I only knew it from its later port on the Turbo Graphics. But man, was I unprepared for the brutality of the original. Holy crap, is this one game that I never planned to 1cc. You may jump super high, but you walk like Master Pai may shoved a pole up your ass and left it there for training. Your very slow movement speed dictates the pace of the game, and the enemies are as relentless as ever, often without ways for you to avoid them, and you'll come across unavoidable damage. So luckily, you have a decent health bar, and with enough practice, that health bar will get you through a level or two. But eventually, some areas are so brutal, it's hard to imagine surviving through the dozen or more per stage without taking some deaths. Tiger Road is a checkpoint game, and they're generous. Pretty much every area has its own checkpoint, so it's great for learning them one at a time, and not having to go back and clear previous ones, as that's one thing Tiger Road does well, with each level broken into creative mini-sections, making you want to see through it and explore the next challenge. Unlike Black Tiger or Magic Sword, Tiger Road has tons of diversity. Not only is each stage unique, often with multiple bosses, but each area looks and feels different. You'll go from scaling upward through stairways, to flying around and avoiding obstacles, platforming challenges, and others just overcrowded with enemies and traps. Each area a mini puzzle to be solved with the health you're given, but only the truly skilled and talented will overcome the entire game without continues. After each stage, you have a master's challenge. And if you succeed, you're upgraded in some way. And if you fail, things are just going to get even harder. Whether more health, damage, or a projectile weapon when near full health, they're all pretty much a requirement for anyone trying to get a 1cc. But even having to continue a few times along my playthrough, I had a fun time slowly figuring out each area and checkpoint, working my way through the game. The art design and aesthetic has a wuxia vibe, and there's almost no repetition in backgrounds or assets as you progress through the game. You pick up a handful of weapons along the way with some other power-ups or health, 
but the main loot are points, which will help you earn enough extends to make up for the times you'll inevitably die. Heck, this one boss is an insta-kill. One touch, you die. <laughs> so don't screw up. My biggest recommendation to enjoy Tiger Road is to play it without worrying about the clear. The checkpoint system already ensures that you can't just credit feed it. So just slowly work your way through and learn each level in sections. The controls may be stiff and some parts seem unfair, but it's a nice change of pace from the manicness of the other games. It's definitely not any more unfair than the original Ghosts and Goblins, and there's not many other platformers of the era quite like it. really looking forward to playing Gunsmoke after growing up with the NES port and loving it as a kid. So it pains me to say that we have a bit of a legendary wings on our hands. If you watched my original Arcade Stadium 1 review, you'll know that game kind of threw me for a loop. Not only was the original on the collection insanely hard, but it didn't live up to what I felt was the superior NES game. Gunsmoke follows in those footsteps. By being so damn hard, it's difficult to enjoy, at least on the default setting. How hard is it? Let's say you could try to clear Dodonpachi afterward to calm your nerves. Gunsmoke isn't just hard, but it's hard in the most unfriendly ways that don't make you want to keep playing. You'd think that the ability to fire left, forward, right, and even split shot would make it easy to cover the screen, but you'd be mistaken, as you can't fire behind you, which the game chooses to exploit cheaply and constantly, with super fast enemies that regularly appear in areas that you can't reach, and then proceed to follow you around while spewing bullets from behind, almost buzzing like flies, and collecting until there's just too many. Failing to route a level results in being completely overwhelmed, with an impossible to dodge stream of bullets from every direction. The other problem is your limited and weak shot, not reaching the end of the screen and dealing very little damage to the power-up barrels. The way to survive is to keep the screen clear by killing most enemies as they appear before they fire or grow too numerous, and then learn all of the important barrel locations and avoid the rest. They take so many shots to destroy that you'll get quickly overwhelmed by enemies unless you pick and choose the right ones wisely. The most important power-up of all is the horse, pretty much a requirement to grab every single one if you want to survive, as it lets you take three extra hits. And believe me, you'll be taking them, especially from these assholes that run up on you from behind and just stay there, refusing to go away until you can loop around behind them for the kill. The bosses in the game are especially nasty, as you'll be dealing with non-stop incoming swarms of their henchmen, while the big bad jumps around the screen avoiding your shots. Starting from stage 3 onward, some feel downright impossible without getting there first with your horse. To absorb some shots during the battle, it's not so much difficult as frustrating, as the the way enemies come at you can be downright unfair. It's predictable, but not predictable enough to do anything about it. It's an older game, so there's a lot of repetition in stages and backgrounds, with the NES port having way more variety. The NES port is really fun and has better, pretty iconic music to top it off. Give this one a shot, as the core idea is very cool, but the NES port will give most sane players a much better experience. Some arcade games take their purpose of eating quarters a bit too far, seeming like that's their only purpose, with fair, learnable, or even fun gameplay being a distant second. Either that, or the default difficulty on this collection is set way too high. I won't be revisiting this one much, and sticking to the superior NES port. Oops, sorry, wrong show. Eco Fighters definitely has that Captain Planet vibe going on, for anyone that remembers that old series. You could have guessed that this game was environmentally themed, with you fighting back against evil corporations that are destroying the planet and beyond, with the stages starting off looking beautiful and pristine, before shifting to a corrupted backdrop that ruins the party, with things like acid rain, pollution, or garbage the farther you progress. How often do you see an eco theme in a shooting game? So I do find the design and concept a breath of fresh air. <laughs> 
along with the great graphics are the light-hearted, upbeat, and very good tunes that perfectly fit the style of the game. It may not look it, but Eco Fighters has some things in common with Forgotten Worlds, mainly your weapon that you rotate around the screen 360 degrees. So unless you want a cumbersome experience using buttons to rotate around, I recommend you map the analog stick for the rotation, making it feel more natural. Once that's out of the way, you'll find a super unique, beautiful to look at, and most anticipated shmup of this collection as it's seen very few console releases and is pretty obscure overall. The other unique aspect are the weapon types. Some short-ranged, like the hammer or plasma sword, attached to an extendable arm, forcing you to get up close and personal for the big damage. Each weapon has its own mechanics, which changes up your playstyle, and it's fun to experiment with the different types. The plasma sword can almost be used like a fire hose, spraying back and forth to deal damage and wash incoming bullets away. There's also a charge attack that builds up automatically and fires off whenever you lay off the trigger. The game isn't overly difficult, but it does have some pretty cheap moments during the boss fights, where avoiding death is sometimes impossible. RNG in shmup terms so you'll need that handful of extra lives for whenever it rears its ugly head. But if you're a fan of horizontal shooters and not yet tried Eco Fighters, it's definitely the number one must-play shooter of this collection. Great presentation, large, awesome bosses, fun music, replayable, unique, and very much worth your time. If only we could actually solve our environmental problems with a spaceship and a laser sword. Or maybe just a giant hammer would do. The power is yours! I've been playing Sidearm since it released back on the Turbo Graphics, and it's been a nostalgic favorite ever since. That port was not only arcade perfect and nearly identical along with the difficulty, but improved the music by a huge margin with some of the catchiest tunes on the console. It does have some minor differences, including fixing some of the bugs from the arcade version, so it's overall the superior way to play. But don't blow off the arcade, as they're otherwise very close. The stages are continuous, flowing from one to the next, and the pace of the incoming enemies never lets up. It's an older game, so the biggest flaw is the lack of enemy and boss variety, with most repeating in different variants throughout. But the stages are varied, don't repeat, and flow well into one another. The floors and walls can't hurt you, and there are no environmental obstacles or little memorization to worry about, and in fact are often hiding all sorts of items and score bonuses. Power-ups are copious and all over the place, but the constant flow of enemies can make shooting and grabbing the ones you want a challenge with the most important being your ship upgrade, combining with another to give you an 8-way shot with much better 360 degree coverage, and the ability to take a hit. You can fire forward or backward, with a third button swapping between the various weapons that you've picked up. The biggest challenge as the game gets going is managing all the power-ups on screen, while dealing with the onslaught of enemies from all angles, especially the super fast snakes that come racing in, chasing you around the screen. You shoot the power-ups to change them, and because there's so many, you you often just need to quickly grab them all to keep the screen clear for killing enemies. I can't promise that you'll enjoy the game as much as I do, as it can be quite tough and lacks the variety of the newer games. But there's something about the controlled, wild speed of the game that works for me. But if this looks kick-ass to you, give it a whirl. You may be surprised by how easy it is for a quick run every now and then, even if you'll only get so far, no expectations. And having reviewed it in my Every PC Engine Shooters video, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. Three Wonders is an arcade cabinet I never came across as a kid, and I have to say that two of the three games seemed right up my alley. A combination of three games in one, you have a run-and-gun platformer, a shooter, and a puzzle game which seems totally unrelated to the first two. Now I'd seen screenshots before and learned of the games later in life, but never had a chance to play. Aside from the colorful and creative fantasy visuals, what struck me first is how the first game, Midnight Wanderers, felt like it belonged on a console instead of the typical quarter-munching, brutal arcade experience. 
I actually found myself blowing through the first three stages without much effort. The game is fun and controls like a slightly stilted metal slug without the ability for diagonal fire, but it's otherwise a great looking little platformer that could be mistaken for a Super Nintendo game. Aside from the somewhat slow and low difficulty opening, the platforming does become more challenging down the stretch. A short game at only five stages, it's easy to run through and looks like it'd be more fun in co-op. I admit, something about the gameplay isn't quite addicting. So now that I've completed it, I'm not sure how often I'd keep coming back. With the stages memorized, you can run through it easy enough. At the same time, I'd highly recommend it for a quick playthrough, if you already own the collection anyway, as the time I did spend was worth it. But the cool part is it doesn't end there, as you can then continue the adventure, where the gameplay takes to the skies. Fortunately, the shooting game, Chariot, didn't have nearly the amount of resources and effort put into it as Wanderers. It's a decent shooter in terms of mechanics and even has a really unusual gimmick, where you slowly grow an invincible tail as you power up. Its purpose is to destroy enemies from behind and to your flanks as well as block bullets, coming into play quite a bit as the stages progress. The problem is it recycles a lot of assets from the first game, which on its own would be okay, but it also recycles its own backgrounds and stages. So although you have several stages to complete, many of them are simply repeats of previous levels. So it immediately becomes repetitive and not really a complete game, despite the bosses being unique and really creative. You end up seeing the same backgrounds over and over. Again, it's worth playing through and has some good challenge down the stretch, but ends up feeling like a rushed, not complete game. Much more so than the first, which while short, was creative to the end. And um, I ended up skipping the third puzzle game altogether, as it didn't really catch my interest. So overall, this one's a mixed bag for me. I liked the first feeling like a proper console platformer and worth a play, while Chariot had potential but was ultimately disappointing. A cool game, but more of an add-on with repetition and visuals, and a long, annoying boss rush to pad out the final stage. Not bad, but not one I see myself coming back to either. Capcom sure had a thing going for D&D fantasy games in the 80s and 90s, and King of Dragons goes all in with the concept. The best thing about the game is the super creative art design, with enemies and bosses often straight out of a Wizards of the Coast bestiary. Orcs, wyverns, troglodytes, dragon knights, and dark elves. The game's got it all across 16 levels. That sounds like a lot, but they're really quite short compact and never overstay their welcome. So for us D&D geeks, picking our favorite class and going in co-op with a handful of quarters was irresistible. And back then as a kid, it was enough to keep coming back. The game's mechanics are super basic, so if you're looking for a deep beat-em-up, you'll likely be disappointed. You have a single type of attack and a jump. No combos, dashes, bumps, special or alternate moves. It plays more like a hybrid hack and slash with enemies that generally die quickly. So the game feels brisk as you're always moving forward, not beating on enemies until they finally run out of health. So the nuance in King of Dragons comes from your placement on the screen, strategic jumping and avoidance, and using the power items at the right times, which you can bump along the screen through the level until you need it. It's a game you can actually speedrun, and something that's refreshing compared to the much slower paced, methodical, true beat-em-ups like Final Fight. But even if you don't take the time to dig into the game's mechanics much, and just want a button mash and romp, the aforementioned great art design and variety is a highlight, and the compact stages are arcade perfect. Trying out different classes gives you incentive for more playthroughs, and it's always better playing with a friend. I was lucky to have my son visiting for a week for part of this review, so we got to play this and several of the other games co-op, which is really how many of these games come into their own. King of Dragons isn't in the same league as Capcom's more popular beat-em-ups, but it's good fun for what it is and a faster paced game that I can enjoy replaying, especially with my son or a friend, as that's how they were designed to be played. An 
actual beat-em-up, Knights of the Round, arrived the same year, with an increased set of gameplay mechanics to go along with it. Better in the beat-em-up sense, as though you still have no grappling or dash moves to speak of, you do get an extra attack move, along with a more powerful forward swing. Still quite basic and sparse compared to Capcom's best, but it does add a horse that you can mount along the way with its own set of moves. The visual character upgrades are also a great addition, beefing up your armor and weapon as you level up, making you look more and more badass. It seems trivial, but it's a big part of what kept me going back in arcades, wanting to see the final, upgraded version of my character. I was always a Lancelot guy, because the trusty elite warrior is always cooler than the big cheese. Kind of like how Legolas is cooler than Aragorn, right? So the downside of Knights of the Round is it's far more grounded than King of Dragons. Now it's not totally realistic, but you won't see anywhere near the cool bestiary and variety, with most enemies being humanoid and no dragons to speak of. I mean, there's some mention of dragons in Arthurian legend, right? But despite the less fantastical design, the graphics are a step up and excellent. If you're looking for a true beat-em-up, Knights will scratch that itch more than King of Dragons, though I do prefer the latter for its faster paced and more interesting design and bestiary. Neither are on the level of the later D&D series games, nor close to Final Fight in terms of gameplay, let alone later games that we'd still love to see in these collections. But both King of Dragons and Knights of the Round are fun enough and cool for an occasional playthrough. And again, always much better with a friend. If you ever wanted Mega Man Boss Rush modes turned into an arcade game, then these two power battle releases are for you. I originally expected them to be Mega Man based fighting games, but they're nothing of the sort. They play almost exactly like the boss battles of the earlier games. Simplicity and all. The mechanics are identical with just a shot and a jump button, and a third to cycle weapons that you acquire as you progress. You can charge shot and slide just like the originals, so you work through the roster, using each boss's weakness against them, until you reach some final battles in Wily's Castle, with three different game modes featuring bosses across the first seven games. The graphics and sprite work are nice, and the classic tunes are always welcome and add the right bit of nostalgia to the game. But what surprised me was how easy it felt, even compared to the actual platformers. My son and I jumped into the first game playing co-op, and to be fair, we're both very good at and can easily clear most Mega Man games. But on our very first try, without practice, only needed a single credit to get to the final boss, and even nearly cleared it that way. That just doesn't happen with arcade games. It's short anyway, with just a handful of fights before the end game. Cool while it lasts, but unusually easy. I can imagine the operators must have been cranking those dip switches back in the day to turn it up. The second game, Power Fighters, at least to me, felt even easier blowing through the game without death until the final boss on the first try, which finally needs some actual memo and practice to get the clear. The roster here is just as extensive, and you now get access to your animal companions to boot. Three story modes, each with their own set of several bosses, so you end up with a total of over 20 different ones to fight, even though the stages remain the same, and you get a new character duo as an option. But otherwise, the mechanics aren't all that different from the first game. Both games are missing any kind of versus mode that I could find, which would have been really cool. So while it looks like a fighting game, it's simply a Mega Man boss rush. It is cool, but it lacks the depth of an actual fighting game, and is only so replayable without the platforming to go along with the boss fights. But not having any sort of PvP option is a bit odd, as I could definitely see potential there, and would have loved to play against my son one-on-one. -on -one. Yet they're both really cool games and worth playing, just lacking the depth and really the difficulty to keep me coming back. Get ready for one of the coolest, most surprising shooters that you've never heard of, at least I never had, 
When I saw Last Duel in the games list, I originally mistook it for an obscure fighting game, but it turned out to be one of my favorite surprises of the collection. It reminds me a bit of that old cartoon Mask, where the vehicles transformed into jets and similar. As you alternate between the two on stages, you start out driving and can actually control your speed on screen, though I don't think there's a bonus for going any faster. You'll need to go near full speed though on the later stages as you have jumps to make on a regular basis. Yes, your roadster can jump and it's a primary mechanic on damage avoidance, with it giving you invincibility frames while in the air. That becomes necessary when the roads get cramped with enemies, as it's easier to jump them than dodge them or some of the bullets. At the end of each road stage and boss, you'll transform into jet form and proceed to a traditional shooting stage. Instead of a jump, now you get a roll, but you'll need to be strategic about it as you can't use it constantly, and best off saving it for moments where you'll likely otherwise die. For an older game, the graphics are quite nice and sharp, with each stage and boss unique and little repetition. Some of the stages can feel on the long side, but the game is still brisk overall. The music is alright, not anything to write home about, but fits the game well enough. Really. Last Duel is just a solid shooter that was completely unexpected and I had a great time with, as did our friend from Weeb Nerd Gaming when picking up the Quick 1cc, and was gracious enough to let me show off some of his gameplay. Don't ignore Last Duel, it's a surprisingly well made game and recommended for any fan of the genre. Street Fighter, Darkstalkers, Marvel and more. When it comes to fighting games, no company dominated the market like Capcom. They were untouchable. Only SNK could stake a claim to being on their level. And no Capcom collection is complete without an endless array of fighters. If you were a kid in 1987, you've got memories of how and where you played Street Fighter 2. For me, it was the local 7-Eleven on my way back from the comic shop every weekend, spending a couple bucks playing against friends and talking smack. And for me, fighting games always remained a social activity, and something I enjoyed mostly in arcades and with friends. Sure, I played them at home on and off, but the magic of standing shoulder to shoulder on a cabinet wasn't there. Now my son on the other hand is a huge lover of the genre, so whenever he comes to visit, it's an opportunity for me to enjoy how these games were meant to be played again, and an opportunity for him to kick my ass. At least playing Street Fighter Anniversary was like wearing an old pair of shoes. And I love this version as I can choose between my old favorites like Champion Edition or Turbo. It's as definitive and complete a version of Street Fighter 2 as you'll get, not counting the censorship stuff that I won't get into. But if you can only have just one Street Fighter 2, and actually don't already have Street Fighter 2 on several other collections, then it's hard to go wrong with this one. Gem Fighters is a much simpler, but incredibly fun game that surprised me with how competitive it was. The mechanic of fighting over gems and then knocking them out of each other to power up adds a new dimension to not only the game itself, but the level of smack that ensues from the tense moments it creates. We literally had as much fun playing it as the real Street Fighter, and I'd gladly come back to it again. No, not the original Street Fighter. That game sucks. It was Gem Fighters that got a big thumbs up from both of us. Neither of us had ever played Slam Masters, or maybe I have once or twice so long ago in arcades I don't remember, but I can definitely see how nostalgia drives some love for this one. Wrestling was in its prime and any game to tap into that hype was gonna get some quarters, but playing it today, I'm not really getting too much out of it with the very simple mechanics and slower gameplay. I could be completely missing the boat as I'm a casual when it comes to fighters. But after playing Gem Fighters previously, neither of us got too much out of it before moving on. Wrestling is all about the spectacle, suplexes and backbreakers. And while there are some here, I expected to see a lot more, especially compared to other wrestling games that I've played. If you know and love this game, who cares what I think? Play it. You've got all three Street Fighter Alpha games here, and we mainly focused on three, that being my son's favorite and most played, so I had zero chance of even putting up a fight and gave up after a few rounds, letting him run the game on his own and recorded the footage for the video. 
It's interesting how pulling off the moves slowly became easier and required less precision as the series progressed, letting you focus more on the fight and less on perfect inputs. Of course, the final boss is as cheesy as ever, possibly reading your inputs as you make them, then taking away half your health with his special. But it wasn't enough to deny my boy the victory, and in a pretty spectacular fashion. And finally, we hit up the Darkstalker series and spent most of our time with the latest, Vampire Savior. And though both of us have played it casually in the past, I mean, who hasn't at this point? Neither of us were all that familiar to play it too competently. That being said, it shows what made Capcom fighters like this and the Marvel games so popular. The phenomenal character design and artwork is just a joy across all three games. Really, along with SNK, Capcom had the best character artists of the era and it shows. Many like Morgan and Felicia had the staying power to show up across future games and pop culture for years to come. You may be wondering why I'm lumping all these games together and not breaking them down in detail. Because like I said before, while I enjoy playing them with a friend, I'm a fighting game casual. I just play them for fun and have no business breaking them down, like I do with other genres that I excel in. But this time, I didn't want to simply ignore them as they're a critical part of the collection, and I finally got to enjoy them two-player with my son. I imagine that while many of you watching are truly great and play them with a high level of skill, most are just like me and can play them well enough to not look like a chump, but still only understand them on a surface level. And that's what makes them still so popular today. Anyone can pick up and enjoy them in a shallow way, but truly Truly skilled players can play them for decades and still find nuance and techniques to discover, just like shooting games that I obviously love so much. And for that reason, it's a genre that'll likely never die, for both casual and hardcore players alike. Now if you're a competitive player, you'll likely find other collections a better choice, as Capcom again hasn't chosen to include online play with this release. A big downside in my book. If you play them seriously, you're likely using Fightcade or another dedicated fighting collection where you can compete with others more easily. But for the rest of us, or at least for my son and I this past week, it was more than enough to have a great time playing some old favorites and discovering some new ones. However, I did discover something disturbing on the technical side during my testing that you need to know. This collection does not handle all third-party controllers equally in terms of input delay. While using my RAP5 Hayabusa, I made some random tests, and it scored on average one and a half frames slower than the Joy-Con in most games. Magic Sword and King of Dragons were over two frames slower. Now I did a big Switch controller shootout in an old video, and this RAP5 is only three quarters of a frame slower than a Joy-Con, and a great choice to use for most Switch gaming. And since few people really play these games with the crappy Joy-Con, you pretty much don't know what true input delay you're getting with your controller, as it will vary. I also tried the trusty RetroBit pad, which I tested previously at just under half a frame slower than the Joy-Con, the fastest performer. And it wasn't nearly as bad as the Rap 5 stick, being just over half a frame slower on Magic Sword but then a full frame slower on Black Tiger. Inconsistent, meaning you don't know what to expect with each game, let alone with your choice of controller. These same pads and sticks test consistently when used elsewhere. So while I have nothing but praise for the overall solid job Capcom did here with the input delay on the games, there's an issue here with the third-party controller implementation and something that they should look into. Overall, how would I rate this collection compared to the first in terms of game selection? Personally, I'm a bigger fan of the first. There's just too many great shooters on there, like Pro Gear, 1941, 19XX, Varth, Forgotten Worlds, Gigawing, and more. It's a bit of a shooter fan's haven, really. I enjoyed Eco Fighters on this collection. That was a highlight. And being able to play it with the arm mapped to an analog stick is gold. Discovering Last Duel was great too. But overall, no contest. The first wins hands down for shooting games. The first also had the best platformers with Strider and Ghouls and Ghosts headlining, but other very fun ones like Bionic Commando and Megatwins. And while I'm a big fan of Black Tiger and Magic Sword here, 
They'll never trump Strider and Ghouls and Ghosts for me. Now it's a bit of a tie on the beat em up front as Final Fight is a classic and Captain Commando is fun. But I'm a fan of King of Dragons and really enjoyed it here. But when it comes to fighting games, really important for most Capcom fans, no contest. This second stadium collection blows the first away. The original was mostly full of Street Fighter 2 variants and some other unique ones like Cyberbots. They can't touch having all three Street Fighter Alpha games, three Darkstalkers games, Super Gem Fighters, and Street Fighter Anniversary. I know that most of us would have preferred Capcom release these new games as an extension of the first collection, as honestly, we all thought that was the whole point of the first one, a single repository for this generation of Capcom's classics. But at least they've unlocked the ability to buy games individually, so you can pick and choose what you want, whether on Switch, PS4, Xbox, or Steam. And if you never saw my in-depth review of the first collection, you're truly missing out as it was a great production and one of my all-time best performing videos. The exclusive shooters in that collection especially were not to be missed. And if you're interested, you can check out that video next, right here.